Welcome to the Invested Dads Podcast, simplifying financial topics so that you can take action and make your financial situation better, helping you to understand the current world of financial planning and investments. Here are your hosts, Josh Robb and Austin Wilson. Podcast. Peter Piper picked a pickle pickle podcast. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back to the Invested Dads podcast. Thanks for listening and being with us today. Today, we are going to witness an epic battle between two longtime rivals, those being renting versus buying a home. All right, Austin. You know, that's the big debate. And that's one I, I do get asked a lot about. You know, as people come in or we're looking through their financial projections and their plans, you know, one of their questions is, you know, what should I do? Should I own a home or should I rent? And you know, that's one that every person has a unique situation, like a lot of things. Um, so in this episode, we're really not going to give you the one answer of yes, rent or yes, buy. Um, we're just going to talk through the thoughts on each of those and which options make sense in, in certain situations. Because it really does come down to what are your plans um, in the short term and in the long term, and which of those two better help you achieve those goals. So we encourage the listeners to always talk to their financial advisor um, and make sure that this fits in with their larger goals and their larger plan. So I guess it's probably good to start off with some stats. Always good. I love me some stats, 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 stats. Was that dramatic? That was an echo. That was an echo. Okay, statistics. I love stats. Realtor.com has a good article. We'll throw it in the show notes below. The data is actually as of July 18, but it tells an interesting trend here in the U.S. So only 41% of the nation's population lives in a county where a median income family can afford to buy a home. So that means less than half of the population lives where the average person can afford to buy a home. That's crazy. Nationally, the cost to buy rose 14% from July 2017 to July 2018, while the cost to rent only increased by 4%. So that makes me glad I bought my home in July of tw- or in June of 2017. That is a big difference in a, in a matter of a year. According to an article on CNBC, which we'll also throw the link in the show notes, renting now may actually be a better investment depending on where you live. Renting and reinvesting the savings from renting, on average, will outperform owning and building home equity in terms of wealth creation, according to research from Florida Atlantic University and Florida International University faculty. That is the first time that renting has actually outperformed buying since 2010, and in 16 of the 23 major metropolitan markets that were covered in that research, renting is actually a better investment than buying. So some of those big metro areas include Atlanta, Dallas, Denver, Houston, LA, Miami, San Francisco, and Seattle. Now, if you live in an area like we do, like in the Midwest and Ohio, it still is better to buy than rent in much of the area like we're in in the Midwest or in the Northeast, where Chicago and Cleveland actually show the best ownership scores. So Chicago is kind of that outlier. It's a large city, exactly. but it still is better to own than it is to rent. And I think that that just all comes down to uh, supply and demand, right? So in some of those areas, we've got a shortage of housing. So housing is super, super expensive to buy. But in some areas where you've got a little bit more supply, yeah. the prices are more affordable and more attainable. Yep. And so there is no right answer that goes across the board for everybody. In fact, depends who you ask, you're going to get a different answer. So you've asked people over at CNBC, you know, they're going to say, they're probably going to listen to like Jim Cramer and say, bye, bye, bye. But, bye, if, bye, bye. but if you ask somebody that works on Broadway, performs on Broadway, what are they going to say? Sell, sell, sell. No, they're going to say rent, just like the uh, popular oh, uh, show there. Stop. See what I did? See what I did? I did not see where you were yeah. going with that. So there's no right answer, uh, which brings me to a couple points. My first point is where you live really does matter. Yeah. And so depending on where you're at, that will help determine the cost because uh, like we saw there, you know, there's some places where there just is not a lot of buildings, houses, or property that you can buy to to own. There's a lot more high-rise apartments, complexes where, you know, the, for space saving, they have a lot of people living in one spot. And so that's the more efficient way of doing it. I know here in Finley, we've got probably a couple buildings with like five or six stories. Yes. You know, that's pretty high. Pretty high rise. <laughs> so it's crazy. <laughs> um, and so think of that, for instance, in New York, it takes 141% of the average person's income to own a home. So the average person's income, you need 141% of that to own a home. Where to rent, it only takes 30% of the average person's income. So you can see again why in a place like that, That's a big renting gap. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but then you can go the other direction. So if you look at a place down in Georgia, in Clayton County, 
it only takes 18% of your income to own a home while it takes 32% to rent. So it's cheaper to own a home down there than it is to rent. And this is an example of why a lot of people who might kind of refer to themselves in what's quote unquote the gig economy, where they're kind of freelancers, they do whatever they want, they can work from home. A lot of those people are flocking to those not necessarily Clayton County, Georgia, but those areas where it is so, so, so cheap because they can work from anywhere. They can work from their home office. And if they can make the same money that they're making in another part of the country, they can really make a good spread on their income there versus their costs. Yep. And you see the same thing as when people retire, a lot of people move to a lower cost of living spot because it is cheaper. And so while their salary goes away and they're living on their retirement or a pension or whatever, moving to a lower cost, place to live makes a lot of sense you, your I'm dollar gonna, goes farther i think i'm gonna move to winnebago that's hey there's nothing van down by the river you know i, I know uh so that's the first point where you live matters the second thing is how long you plan to stay wherever that is that you live has an impact too so the rule of thumb in our industry is if you think you're going to be in a spot for less than five years in general, renting makes a lot of sense, whether it's an apartment or a house or whatever. Renting gives you that flexibility if you don't think you're going to be there long term. The reason for that, obviously, is if there is a slowdown, like we saw in 08, 09, where there's a big drop in housing prices and really a, a slowdown in people buying houses, you're stuck with a asset that has uh, a lot of value tied to it. So prob- for most people, a lot of their net worth is tied up in their home. You're now needing to get rid of that in depressed market. So the prices are down and there's really not a lot of buyers out there. So you're, you're really forced to sell at a loss or a lower price because you're moving. You, for most people, owning a house in a different location than where they live does not make sense. The maintenance, you'd be getting called up and saying, hey, my water heater's out. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm two states over. What do you want me to do? It's you got to call somebody. You got to get make sure they're there. So for a lot of people, if you don't think you're going to be here long term, The idea is, okay, renting makes sense because I'm just tied to that lease. How long am I going to be there? 12 months, six months, whatever your lease is. When that's up, I can walk away. There's no obligation for me to do anything. And so for people who have a lot of transition in their life, that's renting makes a lot of sense. And I think that that's especially important when you look at young people starting their careers and there's a lot of opportunities to move around and do whatever they need to do. They could take a job in a bigger city or a different city on, at the drop of a hat, really, if they've got, if they're renting. It's not def- necessarily difficult to find a sublease for their apartment or whatever. And even if they have to pay the lease the rest of the time, they're only stuck paying it for probably less than a year yep. on top of what they're doing. And a lot of times that that's, a, that's a lot better choice for young people. Yeah. And and on the reverse side, if you're going to be there over five years, historically speaking, you you know maintain or grow your value in a home. You know, obviously the outliers being those like downturns where we're talking about 08, 09. Uh, but the idea there is then if you do go to sell and you do have to move, there's an appreciation there uh, potentially for for your asset. Exactly. Uh, but you know, if you're going to be there long term, you allow that opportunity for it to grow over the long run. Or you can just move in with your podcast co-host and. That's the way you got to you got to share a house. You always got to ask the first question. Bef- <laughs> Can we be friends? Well, first question is: Do you have a pull-out couch? Exactly, exactly. I heard about that finished basement. I'm about to crash right. on it. So we're going to take a pause, and I have a dad joke for Austin. Dad joke of the yes. week. It's a. Uh, it's more just a question. I got two, two options. I'm not sure which one is really it should be. Okay, I'll bring them both. Right. So we live out here. There's a lot of farms in this area, and I've always wondered this question. If a cow doesn't produce milk, what do you call that cow? Do you call it two choices? One, do you call it a milk dud? Or do you say it's an utter failure? I'm going with utter failure. Utter failure. That's a good one. <laughs> so, that, it's just a question I've always had. Those are the things that keep me up at night. It is. You always wonder. So I might have to pass that one along. And the other thing, in case you've wondered about cows, do you know why they wear those bells around their neck that you always see? No, I've always wondered. Because their horns don't work. <laughs> so that's that's why i'm learning something new all the time josh all right so back to buying and renting yeah and we're back to the real show the real show and so i guess we kind of just talked about it but where you live and how long you plan to stay there makes a difference so say you're planning on staying in an area for a while josh do you need to look at anything else other than just what are what it would cost to rent versus what it would cost to buy are there any other parts of that equation um, that should really factor into your decision. Yeah. So we remove the 
choice that yeah i'm going to be gone in two years yeah if you're just thinking what's the better choice for renting or buying i'm going to be here for a little while a couple things to think about the first is changing in costs so when you get a mortgage uh, we recommend you get a fixed mortgage uh, because if you get those variable mortgages, arm. Yep, it's called an arm adjustable rate mortgage. You could lose an arm and a leg. Is I was what about I would say. to make a leg joke. Yep. <laughs> so an adjustable rate mortgage means you have a set rate, and then after a certain amount of time, they adjust it to whatever the new interest rate is. Now, if interest rates are going down, not a big deal. If interest rates are going up, or if it has an adjustment to it later on that have a set adjustment rate, you could pay a higher rate later on. Uh, and that's what a lot of people got stuck with is there was an adjustment and the values were down. And so it was harder for them to um, pay for that. Uh, so back to the mortgage though, if you have a fixed 30, 15 year mortgage, it's a set rate during that time frame. They say, okay, it's this interest rate. Here's how much you pay monthly. It's tied in. You know, a lot of times if you have it at a traditional bank, they also tie in your property tax, tie in your all insurance and all that fun stuff. So you have a set payment flat. Now, if you're renting, your rent is set during that lease time period, but mm-hmm. when you renew your re- lease, the landlord may adjust the payment, and there's inflation. So obviously, you know if you're if you're the landlord and costs go up, you want to adjust your income to compensate that. Yeah, I don't think that I've actually heard of any examples of rent going down, but typically it's going to stay the same or go up year over year. Right. Yeah. So that's one thing to keep in mind is if you're comparing them now, what will that be like in five or 10 years? If I'm going to stay in the same area, will will I still be in a good spot if I look at those options from exactly. changing price? On the reverse side, so, you know, and that change, buying makes more sense because it's a flat rate, maintenance costs. Mm-hmm. So that's the opposite true. So if I am renting, maintenance, the obligation is really on the landlord. Pretty much zero for a tenant. Yeah. You know, every maybe little things you do without calling if it's a hassle. Changing a light bulb, you you know, you probably just go out and buy a light bulb and put it in. That'd be a real desperate call. <laughs> yeah, hey, my uh, <laughs> my light bulb's out, and uh, can you come and can you, screw a new light bulb in, in? I know you live a state away. But for for overall, I mean, especially the big costs, maintenance does not exist for a renter. That's the obligation of the landlord. When you own your home, guess what? It's you're, on you. you're the landlord. You're yeah. the one that owns the home. That's you. And so you know. It's kind of like an example of maybe your wife is making a big pot of spaghetti and in dumping out the water to drain it, she accidentally dumps the whole pot of spaghetti into the sink and you can clog up the drain and then have to call. That clogs to get the drain? Rid- Not saying that that's ever happened before, but that's just a theoretical example Who'd of a reason that you may have to call somebody to come fix your apartment you're living in. But some, I mean, that is a reasonably small example, but can you think of like... so? Imagine you're renting and your hot water heater goes out. There's an easy thousand dollars or whatever to have, buy one and have it installed or whatever. That is on the landlord if you're renting, and that's just that can happen overnight yeah. as a homeowner. Yep. And that's the, the or it even gets worse when you start thinking about heaters and furnaces or yada 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 air yeah. conditioning units. We're in, we're in the middle of winter. If your heat goes out, it's not like you can say, you have "Oh, to, I'll save up yeah. for that and get a heater when I have the money saved." You've got to pay it's for cold. it right away. You got you got a cold house, uh, uh angry spouse and you need to get that fixed. That sounds and like so, a Christmas song. <laughs> could be. <laughs> uh, so the idea there, you know, obviously is you need to start planning and budgeting for those repairs right. if you own a home because that is your obligation and your responsibility. And you're more apt to make sure things are well maintained and keep up on yeah. replacing the uh, the <laughs> all those little filters in your refrigerator and yes. stuff like that over time because it's on you if it goes too long. So the next one, uh, I call it HGTV. Mm. So if I move into this new building, let's say I'm renting, and all the walls are white and there's nothing hung on the walls and I want to make it awesome, depending on my lease agreement, I may be limited to what I can do in the place I'm living. True. But if I own the home, guess what? Chip gains to the rescue. That's right. I can tune into HDTV, find out what shiplap really is, and put it on every wall. Shiplap, shiplap, shiplap. I, I've watched all of Fixer Upper. I'm not ashamed to say that with my wife. And uh, we live in a really old house, so we actually have shiplap oh, nice. on two walls. Mostly because it covers up an old doorway that we don't like. But anyway, it was inspired from HGTV from Fixer Upper. But I kind of have been lately considering myself more of a JoJo because I love baking. Yep. JoJo has this recipe for orange scones. This is a total sidebar, but my Lanta, they are good. Yep. Um, so if you want good scones, JoJo's Magnolia Table 
That's not a plug. We're not endorsed at all. I'm just yeah. saying those are dang good scones. That's just this is straight it's up Austin recommendation truth. right That's there. That's just honest truth. So, so what about the tax impact? Yeah, Josh? So so you're limited to what you can do in renting and when you own your home you could paint it bright pink. Who it does it? It's up to you. Well, you can paint it bright pink. Uh, yeah. I probably wouldn't do that. And then so then if we move on to the tax impact. So it's not as big of a deal as it used to be. So the tax act that was passed at the end of 2017 gave a higher standard deduction, which is the kind of default amount you can claim on your taxes to reduce um, your income, the deduction you can take. That's defaulted. If you're married, it's 24000 now. Uh, and so twelve if you're single. And so that is a higher amount. So a lot of people are taking that standard. But before, if you did itemize and show all your individual deductions, you could deduct your interest on your mortgage. And so that interest payment you're paying, the portion that's interest could be deducted. So there's advantage there. And you actually, so prior to that tax law being passed, you actually could also deduct private mortgage insurance if you had that. So if you had less than 20% of equity in your home and you had PMI as part of your payment, you could have deducted that where you lost that capability in 2018 or whatever when that was passed. I think that that tax law on paper, it kind of, you know, I guess kind of discourages it doesn't encourage people to buy home for the tax benefit as much as it used to, but I don't think we've really seen that become an impact of why people aren't buying homes. No, but what you do see is we, in our industry, had seen people maintain a mortgage in retirement when they had the resources to pay off the mortgage. Right. They kept it for the tax reasons. Now there's less reason to keep a mortgage in retirement because you're not getting that deduction anymore. Well, I guess I'm just going to plug my sidebar now then. Um, so speaking of, should I pay down my mortgage or invest? Yes. So just like what you just talked about, I was reading this awesome blog article from a colleague of ours named Jess, who is also known as the Everyday Advisor. She had a great article about, should I pay down my mortgage early or should I invest that? And uh, we'll throw a link into the show notes for that. But it's an awesome blog. And uh, it's she writes blogs every week, very great personal finance recommendations on how to really set yourselves up for success, kind of like what we're trying to do here, and she's really helpful. Um, Another thing that she talks about in that article specifically is, you know, just the choice between paying it down or investing. And her quote was, and I'm going to say this word for word because it's really well worded. So her quote was, if you have tolerance for market volatility and you have extra cash, I encourage you to invest. It's the right answer. Dot, dot, dot. If you don't like debt and building equity brings emotional satisfaction, I encourage you to pay down your mortgage. It, too, is the right answer. It's truly personal preference. So that's a great point. Not exactly what the discussion is about between rent and buying today, but that is a common question that we can definitely delve into further in a different episode, um, but definitely something to think about if you're in that retirement yeah. stage. Yeah, especially with the taxes being changed, there's less And they're always to. changing. They're yeah. not done changing. <laughs> so for renting, going back, the tax impact, you know, it, renting, there is really, there's no property tax. There's just, there's a lot less involved, be, again, because there's no property involved when you're renting. Um, so again, when you're seeing those school levies, a lot of those are tied to your property value. And so a renter will look at that and say, I'll vote for that because it doesn't impact me at all. Well, true. they'll see it down the road if yeah. there's a rent increase. <laughs> but the idea there is property tax is another big cost for the homeowner. So the last thing is insurance. And so again, if you're thinking insurance and I'm renting, all my responsibility for is my personal possessions. So anything that's within the place I'm renting. But not the structure. Not the structure. That's not mine. Exactly. And so it's cheap. You know, renter's insurance, I remember, you know, we were paying like twenty, thirty dollars for oh, renter's yeah. insurance. It's super cheap. And so that was great. When you're a homeowner, you have an asset, a property that is worth quite a bit of money and you've got to pay the insurance to protect that, not just for if something a fire or something burned down, but liability. If someone's on your property and gets hurt, you're the one liable for it. Plus all your possessions. And on top of that, everything else. Yeah. Yes. So, so you're you're adding additional costs. You're insuring costs a there. lot. Yes. And so, you know, the insurance costs again. So when you're just looking at, well, here's my mortgage cost, here's my rent costs, they're about the same. What should I do? Don't forget to factor in those other pieces. Exactly. So we walk through those things to consider. The biggest piece of advice I can offer is for those that are considering which one is make sure what whether you choose rent or buy. You don't overextend yourself. We see that a lot in today's society, especially here in the United States, is you're always looking at the people next door saying, oh man, look at that house they have. Look at where they're living. Look at the car. And you try to keep up with them and you can overextend yourself very easy. And so when we're talking rent, there's a lot of cool amenities that are offered out there. And you may say, oh, look, just for a couple extra $50 here, $100 here, I can get these cool things. 
well, you may end up paying so much that you're unable to enjoy them because you got to get a second job, third job, just to cover all those costs. And I think a key point is that just because the bank or the mortgage company or whatever will lend you X number of dollars to buy a house because of your income and your credit history and all of that, that does not mean you need to take all of the available credit options and say, I'm going to use every single dime that they will loan me to go buy this house. Yeah. That's how people get in trouble. And I think another thing is that, you know, typically, kind of like Josh was just talking about, as people get through their careers and they start making more and more money, it's easy to want to continually upgrade your house, to buy another house, to buy a bigger house, to buy a better house, to move out of the city or into the city or whatever that may be, and continually get more and more expensive over time. When if you slow that down, kind of like the 50-50 rule we talked about, when if you get a raise, right? if you slow that down and don't let any new money that you're making hit your budget every single month, let some of that, you know, put some of that aside in investments or whatever, you'll, your lifestyle will increase less and you'll have less money to want to go buy a new house or whatever and you can hopefully be a little bit content with where you're at and if you the longer you can stay in a cheaper house that can make a big difference over time yeah the slower like you said austin the slower you can keep your living or your lifestyle from growing the slower that grows the better it'll be in the long run for every dollar you keep out of your budget now that's one less dollar compounded growth over time yeah. that you'll need in retirement. And so that's huge. And the other thing is too, is we've seen people who are what I would call house rich and cash poor, meaning they have value in their properties. But when you need money, it's not like you can go and cut the corner of your house off and turn it in for a little bit of money, <laughs> yeah. right? You, this, It's tied to that value of that property. And right. if you don't want to sell that property, there's, there's, there's ways to get the cash up, but it's very limited in what you can do. Yeah. Um, and so- Again, you can overextend yourself to the point where it's a struggle for your daily cash flow just because of the cost of that big And just because you, yeah, you can afford that payment even every month, not necessarily even on the mortgage origination side, but just because you can afford a, a two dollars $3,000 mortgage every month doesn't mean that it's the best choice and that's the best use of all of that money every month. That's right. If you can be okay with a little bit less, that frees up money to A, invest, be just have a life, you know. It's you don't want to be eating. So like moderation, then, huh? Something about I, this guy. I I listen to him a lot. He talks about moderation, mostly involving donuts. But it, and good. that's really where it comes down to rent and buying. It's not a make or break for your financial success. It really isn't. It's where am I at in my life? What makes the most sense for my family right now? And then from there, it's kind of reevaluation. Did things change? Should I look at it something differently? Did a great opportunity come up? Those type of things to allow us to make the decision of where should I be right now? But that doesn't make or break your success financially. You can do but, fine either way. But it can help if you make those decisions and make strategic choices along the way. Absolutely. Well, also, just don't forget that we have a free gift for you, and that free gift is a brief list of eight timeless principles of investing. So they're kind of overarching investment themes meant to keep you on track to meet your long-term investment and even retirement goals. So check it out. It's free on our website. We'd love to have you check that out. And, you know, to help keep us growing with this new podcast, um, make sure you tell all your friends about us. We need your help. You can subscribe. Uh, That's great for us. If you leave a review in Apple Podcasts. That is awesome. The more reviews we get, the better we rank. It's not a like, cool thing for us. It's more, the more we rank, the more people will see us, the more people we can help. That's really the whole goal there. We're here to help people. Yep. And then if you get any ideas, we love talking about what you guys would like to hear about. So email us at hello at the invested dads.com. There's a link on our website. And then also share this episode, send it over. There's a little link on your Apple uh, podcasts or wherever you listen to it, there's a way of sharing it to send it to somebody. If you think, hey, they're thinking about this renting or buying option, they may enjoy this podcast. So make sure you do that. And in case you missed it, don't forget uh, our recent episode, we talked about cryptocurrencies and the blockchain technology. So if that's something that you love learning about, check out our recent episode. It was a good one. Well, thanks for being here. We really appreciate you, li- appreciate you listening and uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Invested Dads podcast. This episode has ended, but your journey towards a better financial future doesn't have to. Head over to theinvesteddads.com to access all the links and resources mentioned in today's show. If you enjoyed this episode and we had a positive impact on your life, leave us a review. Click subscribe and don't miss the next episode.
Josh Robb and Austin Wilson work for Hicks and Zerker Capital Management. All opinions expressed by Josh, Austin, or any podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Hicks and Zerker Capital Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Hicks and Zerker Capital Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. There is no guarantee that the statements, opinions, or forecasts provided herein will prove to be correct. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Indices are not available for direct investment. Any investor who attempts to mimic the performance of an index would incur fees and expenses, which would reduce returns. Securities investing involves risk, including the potential for loss of principal. There is no assurance that any investment plan or strategy will be successful.